And today we're hosting uh, Lorenzo Bedino, who is a uh, visiting fellow at the RAND Corporation. He has had fellowships at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, uh, at the United States Institute of Peace, at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He's taught at the University of Maryland and the National Defense University. He's testified before Congress on Capitol Hill. He's written uh, articles for all the major uh, opinion forums, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and also for a wide array of academic uh, journals. He has written uh, two books. The first book was on Al-Qaeda in Europe, but most recently is his book uh, that was published last fall by Columbia University Press, The New Muslim Brotherhood in the West, which is out in the back for sale when you leave. It is really an excellent book, uh, very carefully written, uh, very carefully producing the evidence for his arguments, very judicious, and if you want to know anything about the Muslim Brotherhood in Europe and the United States, this is the place to begin. Uh, we asked him actually to take only one small section of the book, one chapter, the Muslim Brotherhood in the USA, which is uh, uh, partly to make sure you go out and get the book to know what's going on everywhere else with the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, it's a, it's a subject that is loaded with minefields, and it's really hard to imagine a speaker who could walk and not uh, set off those minds. But I think after reading this book, uh, I'm quite confident uh, uh, Lorenzo Vadino is exactly the right person to address this subject, so I ask you to welcome Lorenzo Vadino. set the bar pretty high. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me. Thank you all for coming. I'd really like to thank Al for the wonderful invitation and introduction. Uh, Dr. Templeton and Mrs. Templeton, which I understand are on their way, uh, and FBRI for inviting me um, today. I know how prestigious the, the Templeton lecture is, and it's really flattering that I, I was invited here. Uh, so thank you again for having me. Uh, generally, when I give this presentation, part of me that being judicious, I have a PowerPoint behind me for a variety of reasons. I didn't do this tonight. What I think I'm going to do is sort of have what it's the, called the Italian PowerPoint, which is just excessive hand gestures on my part. <laughs> I, I, I hope you can bear with me. Um, instead of having the PowerPoint, I would like to start with actually a, um, a story which is illustrative of many of the dynamics I'm going to address in my talk. And that is the story of a man called Abdurrahman Alamudi. Some of you might have heard of him. Um, Mr. Alamudi was an Eritrean-born biochemist, a member of the upper class in his country, who came to the United States in 1980 to go to graduate school at Boston University. Uh, after obtaining his degree, went to Washington and got involved in uh, some of the most mainstream Muslim organizations uh, in America. Uh, and he began to develop an impressive network of contacts uh, within the upper echelons of the American political establishment. In 1990, Mr. Alamudi uh, co-founded the American Muslim Council and soon became a regular visitor to the White House, establishing good relationships with both uh, Republican and Democratic administrations. He held frequent meetings before Congress. Uh, he even managed to successfully lobby, lobby Congress to host, for the first time in history, uh, the opening invocation from an Islamic leader in Congress. The Department of Defense uh, put Alamudi in the powerful position of training and vetting the imams who attend to the religious needs of American Muslims in the military. Uh, his organization uh, was praised by the FBI as the most mainstream Muslim group in the United States. Uh, the State Department appointed Mr. Alamudi, Alamudi as goodwill ambassador, uh, asking him to travel throughout the world representing American Muslims. So Washington's establishment clearly considered Mr. Alamudi a successful, representative, uh, and moderate Muslim leader who could be a spokesman and model for the American Muslim community. Uh, in 2003, however, uh, an unexpected discovery uh, during a routine customs uh, inspection at London's Heathrow Airport uh, undid Alamudi's accomplishments. Uh, he was found to have concealed more than $300,000 in his suitcase 
And the investigation that followed revealed that Alamudi had been uh, smuggling uh, cash from Libya illegally since 95, and that specific amount of money was intended to support a murky plot linked to Al-Qaeda uh, to assassinate Saudi crown, uh, crown prince at time, Abdallah. Uh, a year later, Mr. Alamudi pled guilty to all charges and is currently ser uh, serving a 23-year sentence in jail. Uh, the investigation also revealed that Alamudi's financial dealings were with organizations such as Hamas and Al-Qaeda. Now, the interesting part of all this is that to a lot of people in Washington, Alamudi's ties did not come as a complete shock. Uh, since 1990, in fact, law enforcement had been monitoring Alamudi's links to suspected terrorist elements in the United States and abroad. In addition, over the years, Alamudi had repeatedly made comments that clearly displayed his sympathy and ties for Islamist outfits banned in the United States. Uh, once, authorities intercepted Mr. Alamudi when he was on the phone with an interlocutor, and he said that the 1998 bombing of the U.S. embassies in East Africa were to be condemned, were wrong, but only because, quote, many African Muslims had died and not a single American had died. Uh, but Alamudi also expressed his political views in public venues. Uh, in October 2000, speaking in front of the, the White House in Washington's Lafayette Park, literally a block from the White House, uh, Alamudi proudly proclaimed, hear that, Bill Clinton, we are all supporters of Hamas. I wish they had it, but I'm also a supporter of Hezbollah. Now, the case of Mr. Alamudi and the American Muslim Council, AMC, raises a number of questions. Uh, in 1996, AMC claimed to have 5,000 members out of a population of American Muslims that the group itself estimated quite generously uh, to be 7 million. Uh, the number is in reality much lower than that. So how could the head of an organization uh, that by its own calculations represented no more than 0.07 percent of the American Muslim population? whose leadership had never been elected in any way, shape, or form by the Muslim community, and whose leaders was known to the intelligence community as tied to terrorist groups. How could such a group have become the de facto spokesman and interlocutors uh, for the American Muslim community with Washington's, with Washington's establishment? Now, this is kind of the question I would like to address, and the height of Mr. Alamudi's fall uh, makes his case unique. But the issues that are raised by this, <coughs> by this, by this story um, are not limited, really, to him. And tell us something about three interrelated issues that I'd like to address tonight. And the first one is the nature and the modus operandi of the Muslim Brotherhood globally and here in the United States. The second issue is the organizational dynamics of the Muslim community here in the United States. And finally, uh, I'd like to examine the attitudes of the US government regarding the Muslim community and the Muslim Brotherhood to very, complete, uh, to very different issues. So let me start with the first, the Muslim Brotherhood. And I think I want to start with a bit of history. Because um, the Muslim Brotherhood has been in the news a lot uh, lately, but I think it would be probably interesting to do sort of a very brief history of the organization. And as we all know, it's the oldest and most influential Islamist movement. It was founded in Egypt in 1928. And like most of the grassroots movement uh, that appeared in Egypt at the time, was strongly opposed to colonial rule and advocated Egyptian independence. But while most of the, the movements uh, that opposed British uh, colonialism at the time in Egypt uh, took from Western ideologies, the Brotherhood based its discourse on Islam creating what would become the motto of uh, generations of Islamists, Islam is the solution, uh, the Brotherhood saw in Islam the answer to Western military, political, economic, and cultural influence over the, over the Muslim world. Hassan al-Banna, who was the Brotherhood's founder, viewed Islam as a complete, all-embracing system, governing all aspects of life, private and public. For him, Islam was not just quote, empty acts of prostration, but politics, society, economy, law, and culture. Solutions to all problems of Egypt and more broadly of the entire Muslim community worldwide could be found in this complete system, according to the Brotherhood. If, in a way, in its ideology, the Brotherhood was looking at a mythical past as a solution for its current problems, uh, um, its methodology, its modus operandi, was very much modern. 
uh, and in fact, it used a lot of the methods of modern political movements uh, uh, to spread its ideas and to mobilize support. Uh, so grassroots activities, uh, the idea of a bottom-up Islamization of society, creating an Islamic state through proselytizing, to spreading, through spreading the ideas uh, of the group uh, and convincing people uh, to buy into uh, this interpretation of Islam as a comprehensive, all-encompassing uh, system. If Islamization from the bottom-up was the main method that the Brotherhood used from the very beginning, it must be said that violence was also part of the equation at the beginning. Um, so from the 1930s, 1940s, uh, the Brotherhood used violence uh, against uh, its opponents, whether the, British, uh, whether the British, whether the Jewish community, or the Egyptian government. Uh, and the British, the Egyptian government, periodically cracked down on the Brotherhood. Uh, so for years, for decades, the Brotherhood was subjected to very harsh uh, persecution by, uh, by the Egyptian government. And the harshest was in the 1960s, at the hands of Nasser. Uh, torture camps, uh, executions, in, for the lucky ones, deportations. Uh, but in the 1960s, the Brotherhood really suffered heavily at the hands of Nasser. And that led to three developments. The first one was that one wing of the Brotherhood decided to embrace violence completely. Proselytizing was impossible. Uh, the Brotherhood had to use violence to overthrow the Egyptian regime and any other regime that was not Islamic enough. So when we hear that the Brotherhood, that the Muslim Brothers are the forefathers of Al-Qaeda, it is a simplification in a way, but it's partially true. That uh, understanding that only violence can achieve the goal of creating an Islamic State as its origin in the Brotherhood thinking of Said Qutb in the 1960s. A second wing of the Brotherhood in the 1960s uh, decided that violence wasn't uh, going to achieve any success. The Brotherhood was too weak to confront Nasser and the Egyptian regime. Uh, and only grassroots activities, bottom-up Islamization, was, uh, was the, 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 the way forward. <laughs> So the brotherhood that we see today in Egypt that is participating in elections, in the forthcoming elections in September uh, in Egypt, comes from this wing of the brotherhood that decided to find a modus vivendi uh, with the Egyptian regime, technically outlawed for decades in Egypt, nevertheless participating in political life and most important in social life, providing social services uh, and creating this sort of bottom-up Islamization. Finally, the third development that takes place in the 60s is that those that do not opt for violence, do not opt for participation in the system, opt for emigration, leaving Egypt uh, and going to other countries. So m many of them went to the Arab Gulf, to Saudi Arabia and other countries where they occupied some of the leading positions in government, uh, in the ministry, and the education system. But quite a few of them actually came to the West and received political asylum, whether in Europe or in North America. So today, groups in more than 80 countries tra trace their origins to the Muslim Brotherhood and have adopted different forms and tactics according to the environment in which they operate. So in a country like Jordan, they can participate in the election. They've been able to do so for a long time, so they are a political party. In Syria, they've been outlawed for many de decades and they survive underground. Uh, and of course, we follow the news now how the Brotherhood in Syria might be, in a way, uh, re-emerging. Uh, in the Palestinian territories, it took a peculiar turn and became Hamas. Entities belonging to uh, this global movement, which is the Brotherhood, uh, work based on uh, an informal yet very sophisticated network based on personal, financial, organizational, and most importantly, ideological ties. There is sort of a global Muslim Brotherhood in which organizations work according to a common vision but in operational independence. Every branch, offshoot in every country is free to choose its tactics and goals independently. There are consultations and constant communication, but there is independence. It's not a monolithic organization. As I said, this global movement has a presence in the West, uh, and including the United States. The formation of these networks in the United States, as in most Western countries, follows a similar, a similar pattern. Uh, the small numbers of Brotherhood refugees who, who escaped persecution in Egypt, in Syria, and in other countries and came to the West uh, 
soon started interacting with a relatively larger, we're still talking about small numbers, but a relatively larger number of students, member of the upper middle class of their home countries, who came to the US and to Europe to study as graduate students, like Mr. Alamudi, uh, in European and American universities. So these very small milieus that formed in the 1960s, 1970s, uh, bore immediate fruits. And they formed some of the first Muslim organizations in Europe and North America. In the United States, that would be the Muslim Student Association, which was created in 1963 at the University of Illinois. Uh, the West's freedoms allowed the Brotherhood to do what they could not do back home. If uh, they were persecuted in Egypt, in Syria, they were not persecuted, and they could, rightly so, publish their publications, set up organizations, and spread their propaganda in, all, in, all, uh, in different ways in Europe and in North America. Uh, their activism soon attracted other Muslim students and small numbers of Muslim immigrants who had, had no contact with Brotherhood ideology back in their home countries. It's important to point out that the arrival of the First Brothers to America or to Europe is not part of a concerted, arcane plot to Islamize the West, as it is sometimes portrayed. I think I, um, I tried to, to paint it as some kind of fortuitous event that took place because of uh, events taking place in the Middle East. But nevertheless, uh, the small organizations that spontaneously formed uh, in the 60s and 70s soon developed beyond the most optimistic expectations of their founders. I think it's fair to say that today, thanks to a combination of ideological flexibility, uh, unrelenting activism, access to large funding, and poor organizations of competing trends, the networks originally established by the Brotherhood have grown exponentially. Although their membership has remained fairly small, uh, what I call the Western Brothers have shown an, an enormous ability to monopolize the Islamic discourse, making their interpretation of Islam and political events they tie to Islam not yet mainstream, absolutely not, but the most readily available. Moreover, in many countries, uh, the Western Brothers have positioned themselves at the forefront of the competition to be the main interlocutors of local establishments. And the case of Mr. Alamudi is a good, very good example of that. Uh, so exceptions do exist, but for the most part, it is apparent that no other competing Islamic movement has the visibility the political influence, and the access to Western elites that the Western brothers have obtained over the last 20 years. In the US, the nucleus that started with the Muslim Student Association in the 60s uh, spawned a jungle of organizations and acronym, which is quite confusing. I really don't have the, the time to get into, into all these groups, but some names might be familiar, like ISNA, CARE, these organizations. Uh, but form a cluster of organizations each with its own magazine, website, annual, confirm, uh, annual conference, sub-departments, regional branches, uh, but whose unity is revealed by a common financial sources, interlocking board of uh, directors, and occasional participation in, uh, in common uh, initiatives. The few hundred individuals, no more than that, who run them form a small social network united by family, business, and more, most importantly, ideological ties. Affluent, well connected, highly educated and motivated, they are a clique of leaders with few follow followers but ample clout. And in fact, they tend to be the people US authorities reach out to when seeking to engage the Muslim community, as the story of Mr. Alamudi showed. They're not the only ones, uh, it's not a monopoly, but certainly something close to it. Uh, why is that? I think it's a combination of three reasons. Uh, the first one is their organizational skills. They are visible, they are vocal, they lobby, they have offices within a few blocks from Capitol Hill, they are Washington based, and they're very active. Reason number two, competing Islamic organizations are not. Uh, the American Muslim community tends to be very well integrated. Most of them, with exceptions of course, are quite affluent. Uh, they live in suburbs, uh, scattered throughout a huge country, they are extremely divided in terms of ethnicity and country of origin. Uh, most American Muslims do not have <laughs> affiliations. Some might belong to mosques, but simply at the local level. They have little reason or incentive to organize at the national level. 
Islamists do, because they have a political agenda. So it's fair to say that a well-organized minority has managed to position itself as the unappointed, yet de facto voice of a largely unorganized and silent majority. It's also important to note that this organized minorities has views and positions that are not necessarily, necessarily shared by most of the people it claims to represent. The third reason as to why you know, brotherhood organizations have uh, uh, this quasi-monopoly in access to government has to do with dynamics inside the US government. Uh, but I'll get to that in a, in a bit. What I want to talk uh, a bit more about is what is the ideology of these groups? What do they believe? What do they want? So first of all, we cannot really speak of Muslim Brotherhood in America if with this expression we seek to identify offshoots of any Middle Eastern branch, whether Egyptian or any other, of the Brotherhood linked by a dependent relationship. That is arguably incorrect. There is no, as somebody called it, Muslim Comintern with Cairo in the place of Moscow. Uh, the organizations here have historical, organizational, and most importantly, ideological ties to the Middle East, but they are independent. I think we should take a non-formalistic approach. And there it's fair to say that in the United States, we have organizations that have these uh, ties to the Muslim Brotherhood, and we can call them, in a way, uh, American or Western Brotherhood organizations. Over the last 20, 30 years, uh, these organizations have significantly readjusted their tactics and goals. It soon became obvious to a movement as pragmatic as the Brotherhood that blindly applying what uh, the Brotherhood and its founder had proscribed for Egypt in 1930 and applying that to modern London or Philadelphia uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. There is no question that Western offshoots of the Brotherhood support the formation of Islamic states in the Middle East, but their goals for the West are different. Critics argue that Western Brotherhood organizations have the goal of establishing Sharia law in the West. Now, there's no question in my mind that the prospect looms in their imagination, but ideally they would like to see that, no question about it. But the introduction of Sharia in the West is hardly the Western Brothers' goal at this stage. Pragmatic and keenly aware of what they can and cannot do, their priorities lay elsewhere. And foremost among their goals is the preservation of an Islamic identity among American or Western Muslims in general. But unlike some other conservative Muslim organizations, like Salafis, for example, uh, Brotherhood organizations seek to strengthen the Islamic identity of Western Muslim, uh, not, not by isolating them to mainstream society. What they advocate is a sort of uh, conservatism without isolation, an openness without melting, which is, of course, not an easy thing to do. The second goal that is common of all, to all these organizations is being designated as uh, official or de facto representatives of the Muslim community of their country. Despite their unrelenting activism and access to ample resources, uh, the brothers have not been able to create a mass movement and attract the allegiance of large numbers of American Muslims. Majority of American Muslims either reject or for the most part ignore uh, the message that comes from brotherhood organizations. So the brothers understand that a preferential relationship with American elites could provide them with the financial and political capital, the legitimacy, uh, that would allow them to significantly expand their reach and influence inside the community. They would be the ones, like Mr. Alamudi, who would be, uh, uh, would be in charge of appointing imams in the prison system, in the military. They would be the ones the media would call to when seeking the, the Muslim opinion, if there is such a thing. Um, they would, in some cases, that is more the case in Europe and less in the United States, but receive subsidies to administer different social services. So making kind of a clever political calculation, Western Brotherhood organizations are attempting to turn their leadership bid into a self-fulfilling prophecy. So seeking to be recognized as representatives of the Muslim community in order to actually become it. And of course, they would use this position of preferential access to government to lobby government on anything uh, that has to do uh, with uh, Islam, whether it's domestic or whether it's foreign policy. Now, let's, we talked about the first two points, the brotherhood, how it operates, the second point, the dynamics of the Muslim community, how fragmented and unorganized it is, and how that makes it easy for 
an org organized group like the Brotherhood to have that uh, position of prominence despite its small numbers. Now, the third uh, ingredient to this uh, recipe is the attitude of the US government. How does the US government uh, see, perceive these organizations? And the assessment of this Brotherhood offshoots organization, uh, it's really quite chaotic, to say the least. Um, and there's a divide, really, within uh, the policymaking community that mirrors the divide that we see when it comes to the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamist movements overseas. So we have two extremes. We have what I would call the optimists and the pessimists. Sorry for the Italian PowerPoint. Um, on one hand, we see the optimists who argue that Western Brotherhood organizations are simply a, conser a socially conservative force, uh, but unlike other movements they are mistakenly lumped with, uh, um, encourages the integration of Muslim communities, offers a model in which Muslims can live their faith fully and maintain a strong Islamic identity uh, while becoming actively engaged citizens. So according to optimists, governments should not see uh, these organizations with suspicion, but rather they should harness their grassroots activities and cooperate with them on common issues, including terrorism and radicalization. Now, pessimists, on the other hand, see a much more sinister nature in the Western Brotherhood. Thanks to their resources and the naivete of most Westerners, uh, argue the pessimists, Western Brotherhood organizations are engaged in a slow but steady social engineering program aimed at Islamizing Western Muslim populations and ultimately competing with Western governments for their allegiance. The fact that these organizations are not engaged in violence uh, but participate with enthusiasm in the democratic process uh, is seen simply as a cold calculation on their part. Uh, according to pessimists, officials in uh, Brotherhood-linked organizations have understood that infiltrating the system rather than attacking it head-on is the best way to obtain what they want. After all, the tactics used by Al-Qaeda are not gonna really going uh, to obtain much, uh, but a slow, steady infiltration of the system does. Uh, and those that I would call pessimists, which to some degree I would uh, consider myself as one, uh, see uh, quite a few pieces of evidence that point to this duplicity, in a way, in the tactics of, uh, of Brotherhood organizations, and often making the comparison with tactics used by the Communist Party in the United States some 50 or uh, uh, longer, actually, a um, year ago. And some of this evidence, actually, since we're in Philadelphia, I think it's telling to make an uh, tell a story, again, that comes from, from Philadelphia, of all places. Um, some of you might be familiar with uh, the largest terrorism financing case in American history, uh, which was a case um, tried three years ago in Texas against a charity called the Holy Land Foundation. This charity was uh, collecting millions, uh, allegedly for orphans uh, in, uh, in the Palestinian territory, but in reality for Hamas, and the money was clearly going to, uh, to uh, finance terrorist operations in the Palestinian territory. Uh, during that trial, um, the Department of Justice introduced ample evidence of uh, uh, the presence of the Muslim Brotherhood, which was behind this uh, charity, uh, and their activities inside the United States. And some of the most interesting documents come from a meeting that took place here in Philadelphia at the Marriott, not far from the airport here, uh, where uh, some 20 top Hamas and Muslim Brotherhood officials met uh, in 93, right after the Oslo agreements were signed, and talked about how the movement, how their organization could continue their activities as they knew that Hamas was about to be designated as a terrorist organization. And uh, all this meeting was bugged by the FBI. So it's a fantastic spy story because the FBI has uh, all the tapes of everything these individuals said during the meeting, and they are really a fascinating read uh, for a variety of reasons. So. But the individuals there discussing how they should uh, change their activities after the Oslo agreements uh, were debating the uh, two conflicting, conflicting needs that, that they had. On one hand, supporting the Palestinian cause, but rather I should say Hamas, not specifically the Palestinian cause, but specifically Hamas, but at the same time not looking as they were supporting terrorism in the eyes of Americans. So obviously you can see how difficult uh, that is. But what they argued that uh, the movement, the Brotherhood in the United States, 
should have, should have opted for a two-pronged approach that differentiated between its internal and external strategy. So within the Muslim community, the group vowed to maintain its support for, uh, for Hamas by collecting funds, hence the, Holy, the formation of that charity, the Holy Land Foundation, which was then tried in 2008. Um, but at the same time, uh, sought to spread hatred of Israel and Jews uh, among the American Muslim community. And one participant was intercepted as saying, quote, we don't want the children of the American Muslim community who are raised here in Islamic schools and non-Islamic schools to grow up surrendering to the issue of peace with the Jews. At the same time, participants discussed how to camouflage such views to the American public and influence policies and opinions by showing a moderate facade. Argued one, quote, this can be achieved by infiltrating the American media outlets, universities, and research centers, by working with Islamic political organizations and the sympathetic ones. One participant argue, agreed that dissimulating the group's real aims and feelings when dealing with the American public was a necessary tactic. I swear, quote, I swear by Allah that war is deception. This is close of it. Uh, deceive, camouflage, pretend that you're leaving while you're, walking, uh, while you're walking that way. Another, end of quote, another stressed the importance of tailoring the discourse to the American sensitivity. He said, quote, let's not hoist a larger Islamic flag, let's not be barbaric talking. And he argued how uh, organizations should have nice sounding names like Holy Land Foundation, not Al-Aqsa or some Arabic name that might scare people. So these documents are really interesting. I cannot really go at length. And they have given a lot of ammunition to what I've described as the pessimists. And the one document that the pessimists have really used is another document that was a, an internal memorandum that was also introduced as evidence by the Department of Justice during the trial and uh, was written by a senior member of the Brotherhood in the United States. And in one of its points, it stated, quote, the process of settlement in America of the Muslim Brotherhood is a civilization jihadist process with all, the word, uh, with all the word means. The brothers must understand that their work in America is a kind of gra uh, grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands. So you can imagine how this sort of talk gives a lot of ammunition to the pessimists. Uh, personally, I do have clear in mind sort of a distinction between intent and capabilities. I think this is where I s sort of disagree with some of the more uh, vocal critics of, the, of his brotherhood organizations that occasionally go a bit overboard and tend to see brotherhood organization as being everywhere and being almighty. Uh, I don't. Uh, I do believe that they have leverage uh, and have disproportionate influence as I describe it, but I don't want to make them out bigger to be. There's a difference between intent and capabilities. But there is no question that there is ample evidence uh, that at least at their onset, uh, the aims of these organizations were hardly benign. And interestingly enough, uh, this is what makes, uh, let me go back to a bit to Europe. We've been talking about the United States a lot, but this is what gives the ammunition also to uh, intelligence agencies in Europe in being on the pessimistic side and being very vocal about it. This is where we see a big divide between the United States and Europe when it comes to government. Uh, the FBI, uh, intelligence agencies in the, U in the United States are neutral when it comes to these organizations. The Europeans tend to be very vocal about their concerns on these organizations. And I promise this is the last quote that, I, that I'm gonna be reading tonight. Uh, but it comes from the Dutch domestic intelligence, and I think it's very telling. Uh, and it says, not all Muslim brothers or their sympathizers are recognizable as such. It talks about the Muslim Brotherhood in the Netherlands and in Europe by extension. Uh, they do not always reveal their religious loyalties and ultra-Orthodox agenda to outsiders. Apparently cooperative and moderate in their, West, in their attitude to Western society, they certainly have no violent intent. But they are trying to pave the way for ultra-Orthodox Islam to play a greater role in the Western world by exercising religious influence over Muslim immigrant communities and by forging good relations with, rele with relevant opinion leaders, politicians, civil servants, mainstream social organizations, non-Islamic clerics, academics, journalists, and so on. This policy of engagement has been more noticeable in recent years and might possibly herald 
a certain liberalization of the movement's ideas. It presents itself as a widely supported advocate and legitimate representative of the Islamic community. But the ultimate aim, although never stated openly, is to create, then implant and expand an ultra-orthodox Muslim bloc inside Western Europe. These are pretty tough words that come from a government uh, entity, and the Dutch, the Dutch uh, intelligence is quite well respected and, uh, and um, hardly an extremist uh, organization in, in its views. Uh, but in the Netherlands, as in any other Western country, including the United States, there is no common assessment there is no white paper coming from the top and telling all branches of government, all agencies, all government officials how to identify, then uh, assess and engage brotherhood organizations. Uh, positions swing erratically from the optimist to the pessimist point of view based on just personal views, which in many cases are not really informed on facts. Uh, and for a variety of or other reasons, politics also comes into play pretty often, as you can imagine. Uh, but there is a very chaotic situation. And this chaotic dynamic, I think going back, coming back to the United States, uh, is exemplified, I think, by the, the FBI's relationship with CARE, Council of American Islamic Relations, which is arguably the most visible and controversial of these US-based organizations uh, that trace their, or their origins to the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, opinions about CARE could not be more divided within the FBI. I promise it was the last quote. I should have a couple more. I apologize. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I can't really just uh, make up quotes from the FBI. Uh, and on one hand, uh, we have FBI officials who have gone on the records and publicly thanked CARE for its role in, quote, keeping the nation safe and praising it for, quote, its commitment to maintaining a dialogue leading to the frank and honest exchange of ideas. In 2006, the FBI, uh, the, the Washington FBI field office sent CARE a commendation letter praising it for its, quote, dedication in representing the heart of the Muslim American community. Optimist. At the same time, top officials in the FBI, individuals like Steve Pomerantz, who was the former assistant director and former chief of counterterrorism at the FBI, has publicly stated that it is, quote, it is clear from a review of care statements and activities that one of its goals is to further the agenda of radical Islamic terrorist groups by providing political support. By masquerading as a mainstream public affairs organization, CARE has taken the lead in trying to mislead the public about the terrorist underpinnings of militant Islamic movements. In the wake of the Holy Land Foundation uh, terrorism financing trial in 2008, the FBI formally cut its ties to, uh, to CARE. So what is CARE? Good? Bad? Heart of the Muslim community? Thanking them for uh, keeping the uh, honest, frank and honest exchange of ideas? Or terrorist sponsors? We see this in in inconsistency, uh, which is hardly limited to the FBI. I'm singling out the FBI, but I could make examples with many other organizations within the US government and within any U Western government is due to a combination of several, uh, several factors. Uh, the FBI specifically, uh, unlike the Dutch intelligence agency that I mentioned, has a very narrow mandate. The FBI looks at criminal cases. Uh, if you're breaking the law, the FBI opens a file on you, and they're extremely tough. But if you're not breaking the law, they don't look at you. The Dutch intelligence agency has a broader mandate where it looks at all kinds of threats to society, to the democratic order. It's a broader institutional minded, a broader mind. So these organizations might not be engaged in criminal activities, but they might have an agenda that is in the long term subversive or anyway against integration. Uh, but in the United States, for a variety of reasons, and I'm not passing any judgment of whether it's right or wrong, there is no agency that really looks at organizations that could be seen as subversive. But in the case of the FBI specifically, that has to do with the fact that the FBI went overboard and looked into subversive, or what they consider to be subversive ideas back in the 1960s and 70s. So the pendulum has swung in the other direction where now they, by mandate, they don't look at anything that is not specifically a threat to national security. But European intelligence agencies do and take a broader view. So uh, in the, the eyes of the FBI, it's either black or white, criminal or good. Uh, there's a gray area, and I would argue that this is where these organizations uh, lie. Uh, there's also the fact that 
this organization, specifically when it comes to terrorism, play a funny game. Uh, in some cases, they are extremely cooperative. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we had in uh, the hearings of Congressman King, uh, which are, of course, very controversial, but uh, they highlighted one very interesting story of a Somali community leader in Minneapolis. Uh, some of you might know um, Al-Shabaab, the Al-Qaeda affili affiliate from Somalia, has been uh, targeting the uh, Somali community in Minneapolis. There's some 20 American Muslims of Somali descent have been uh, going to Somalia to fight, and a, a few of them have actually died fighting there. Um, so this uh, community leader that testified before Congressman King's um, panel uh, recounted how uh, when he reached out to the FBI to work with them to stop this recruitment taking place in the community, CARE and the other organizations ostracized them. They uh, started a smear campaign against them. At the very same time, we've had cases in which CARE has been quite cooperative with the FBI. And we've had a case of five uh, kids from Northern Virginia who went to Pakistan to obtain training from Al-Qaeda affiliates there. And CARE received a tip from the Muslim community, Muslim community which did not go to the FBI but went to CARE. Uh, and CARE went to the FBI. Uh, so put yourselves in the FBI's director's shoes. And in a way, this is a group you don't want to burn bridges with. You are, so there's kind of this understanding that as much as we're not the ideal partners um, the FBI would like to see when engaging the Muslim community, they're a necessary one. And this is where, I, uh, where, I, where I'm asked occasionally to uh, provide some kind of advice on, so what should the policy be? Uh, you, you stand here, you always criticize, as academics do. Be constructive. What, how should governments... Uh, interact with this organization, how should they deal with, uh, they deal with them? And uh, first of all, I do acknowledge the complexity of the, the issue. Conceptualizing a movement that mixes politics and religion, uh, particularly a religion about which most policymakers know very little, it's very complicated. There's a lot of sensitivities from, in the United States in particular, but in the West in general, in dealing with religion from a political point of view. Uh, moreover, in some cases, Brotherhood organizations display uh, the kind of moderation and pro-integration stance that Western governments are so desperately looking for in their Muslim interlocutors. In other cases, it is apparent that they harbor an agenda and embrace values that are, that are opposed to, uh, to those of a Western liberal democracy. So policymakers understandably find themselves in a bind. Uh, again, we go back to the pessimists and optimists, what the two sort of extremes of the debate suggest. And many among the pessimists um, call for policies that would exclude Western Brotherhood organizations from any engagement, considering them deceitful actors seeking to destroy the very same freedoms that have allowed them to flourish Critics argue that this organization should be, should be marginalized or even outlawed as subversive, sort of the political wing of a global Islamist uh, insurgency. I think that while well, this position highlights some troubling, uh, troubling aspects of the Brotherhood, Western Brotherhood organization's nature and agenda that need to be addressed, this position is unrealistic and arguably dangerous. Although their claim of representativeness uh, are often overblown, Western Brotherhood organizations do represent a cross-section of the Muslim community. If the aim of the government is to hear all voices, it makes little sense to exclude an important one. Uh, talking only to those Muslim leaders whose positions square with the governments and pretending that more confrontational voices do not exist is not a constructive policy. Uh, when they act outside of the law, as when they provide financial support to, to organizations designated as terrorists, like in the case of the Holy Land Foundation, uh, they should be prosecuted, no question about it. But since most of their activities are within the law, they are a reality that cannot be ignored and should be engaged in a certain way. Now, the opposite approach, the optimist approach, argue that Western Brotherhood organizations um, are reliable partners that should be engaged in order to favor integration and stem radicalization. This approach is also very problematic. As I think I outlined today, there's ample evidence showing that the aims of the Western Brothers uh, do not necessarily correspond to those stated in public in dialogue with Western establishments. So assigning an almost monopolistic 
control of the community to a handful of self-appointed leaders whose aims are at best unclear seems naive. Uh, I think there's a better way, there's kind of a third way that lies in between the optimist and the pessimist approach. Uh, and it's what I call sort of engage but don't empower. And first of all, and this is sort of developing to some degree in Europe, uh, the United States to a lesser degree, but it entails three steps. First of all, understanding that assigning a monopolistic uh, control of the community uh, to these organizations is uh, mistaken. The Muslim community is extremely diverse, so speaking only to the most visible and vocal uh, self-appointed representatives of it, the lowest hanging fruits, is a mistaken policy. Governments should be proactive and seek out uh, many other organizations, many other voices which might not have the structure, the sophistication that brotherhood organizations have, but that do represent a cross-section of the community. So the activism and visibility of brotherhood organizations should not be mistaken for representativeness or universal representativeness at least. Uh, the second point is that we need sort of a more refined approach. There are indeed advantages in not isolating Western Brotherhood organizations. Uh, although nobody can really predict uh, the long-term long -term developments, it is arguable that engagement can lead to a moderation of the movement. That is the approach taken, for example, by Sarkozy in France. Could be right, could be wrong, uh, but there's a point to it. Um, isolation, in contrast, could, I'm using a lot of hypotheticals, but could have negative repercussions further radicalizing the movement and also allowing it to be play the, the, the martyr card in the community to some degree. But this engagement needs to be based on a firm understanding of the history, characteristics, connections, modus operandi, and most importantly, aims of brotherhood organizations. So only an informed engagement can lead to a realistic and constructive approach. Finally, I think Many policymakers are increasingly understanding the difference between engagement and empowerment. So establishing a permanent dialogue and even occasional and limited forms of partnership with Western Brotherhood organizations can produce some positive outcomes, particularly in the security field. Uh, I know that's controversial. I'll be happy to uh, explain uh, what I'm talking about in, uh, in the, in the Q&A. But entrusting them with undue powers that were given the keys to the Muslim community appears to be an option that most Western governments are no longer willing to take. So striking the right balance between engagement and empower is not easy, but necessary in order to give an undue advantage to these organizations. Finally, you know, as we look at this kind of a way forward, uh, um, no organization, and this uh, goes for the Brotherhood as for any other political movement, uh, no organization is static, and Brotherhood networks are evolving. The networks that have been created some 40, 50 years ago have changed with time. Um, the first generation that sort of the pioneers that created these networks are uh, slowly uh, just being replaced by a second generation of Western born activists who will inevitably add their perspectives in guiding this organization. So today the debate is, uh, is the more moderate, more in line with Western attitudes and sentiments and sensitivity, language that these organizations are increasingly using, just a more sophisticated facade that people who are born in the West know that strikes a chord with, with Western interlocutors, or is there a genuine change taking place inside these organizations? Uh, there's some uh, scholars, especially French scholars, that argue that these organizations are like the, the Euro-communists, which in the 50s wanted the dictatorship of the proletariat, they wanted to turn France into a communist country linked to Moscow, and by the 70s, the 80s, just wanted you know, fair wages and uh, uh, a good, nice 35-hour uh, week uh, work, uh, work week. Uh, so no longer dreaming of a communist uh, state. And some scholars argue this is what's gonna happen with these organizations. They no longer want to uh, implement that civilizational jihad that the forefathers, that were the pioneers of these organizations talked about 30 years ago. They're just going to be a socially conservative force internally. Other people argue that these pro-democracy, pro-integration statements of the new generation are just a carefully devised smokescreen uh, 
uh, for the movement's real and more nefarious aims. Uh, they're just, the new ones born here are just better uh, Know, know what their interlocutors want to hear, but in reality they are as radicals as those that created those organizations. I think only time would really tell uh, what's going to happen with these organizations. Uh, it is not unlikely that uh, in this milieu some organizations will go in one direction and some other will go in a different direction. But for the time being, I think given this uncertainty, uh, a policy of cautious and informed engagement appears to be the most appropriate. And with this I conclude, and uh, I know I've said a lot of very vague things, which I'd be more than happy to, to explain in the, in the Q&A. Okay. Pat Savadov. Uh, my question, I'm very concerned about the moderate Muslims and why they're not speaking up. Are they, is there a possibility they're not speaking up because they fear that they will be harmed by the more conservative Muslims? And if so, is there any way to deal with that issue? Yeah, no, you raise a very valid point. Where, where are the moderate Muslims? I, I, I think it really goes down to um, at least initially, to a matter of resources. You know, the, 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 one of the points I try to make in my presentation is that it, there's an imbalance in resources. So if we see sort of the West, when it comes to Islam, as kind of a, a tabula rasa, like a virgin territory where you have competition, uh, the advantage of the Brotherhood has been in having access to ample resources. We're not talking about billions, but significantly more than what other uh, competing Islamic groups have had. Uh, so if what we would describe as a moderate organization wants to get its message out. Uh, where do they get the money? How do they do it? And that's, that has been a big problem. I think that is one reason, and the imbalance in resources. The second is absolutely the dynamic you mentioned, is that if you speak out, you, uh, you are incurring to a lot of problems within the community. It could be, in some cases, threats. It could be violence. But it, that does happen. Uh, it could be something more subtle in terms of sort of being marginalized. Um, you know, I think it's a common dynamic in a lot of immigrant communities. You know, I'm Italian, I can, uh, you know, it happened in a way in Italian community some 40, 50 years ago. Those that were de de denouncing certain dynamics, you know, mafia related, uh, in the Amer Italian American community were to some degree, said, well, this is dirty laundry we air in, you know, internally, don't go out and, uh, and do that. So. Uh, there's still that uh, line of thinking. Uh, all these factors together, but I think to some degree we're starting to see more and more voices coming out and also in an organized fashion uh, speaking out. You know, a group like the American Islamic Congress, for example, it's quite organized and it's competing uh, on, in, on college campuses, for example, with uh, the MSA, the Muslim Student Association, and being quite successful because the, the astonishing thing is that once uh, the average Muslim is given the choice, but not necessarily going to go to this organization. So the dynamic on campuses where you have the competition of you know, Muslim Student Association, which is Brotherhood linked, or a group like the American Islamic Congress, yes, some people will go to MSA, but a lot of people will also go to the American Islamic Congress. Uh, before, everybody would go to the MSA, not because they really believe in the MSA message, but because they were the only Muslim organization on campus. So things are changing, and what the I'll wrap it up in a second. But what the, um, some European countries have been doing is providing financial support to some of these organizations that provide an alternative narrative. Uh, that is problematic for a variety of reasons, and it's even more problematic in the United States with the separation of church and state. With a, you, know, you can imagine the, 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 the constitutional and, uh, and political controversy if the United States government were to directly fund a certain religious organization. But uh, in a way, it has to be done. Uh, <clears throat> not as a question, but as a, an answer. OK. Uh, an answer to this lady's question is uh, a quote from Mr. Erdogan, the prime minister of Turkey, when asked about 
moderate Islam, he says, moderate Islam is an insulting term. Yeah. Islam is Islam. That means there's no negotiation, there's no question, there is no options. It is what it is, and if you don't like it, that's your problem, not ours. Uh, and that uh, uh, also comes to my question. Why do we spend all this time and effort trying to s sort out fly specks from black pepper with boxing gloves on? <laughs> we are uh, addressing the, the frills, the symptoms. We are not addressing the source of the problem, which is Islam. It isn't Al-Qaeda, it isn't the Muslim Brotherhood, it isn't CARE, it's Islam. And as I've said in public forums, tell me when you started the reform and I'll tell you an idea of when you'll end up and that's 500 years from now. But with Islam, where is the solution? There's been no reform. I've talked to international students, who are not students, but think tank people who are trying to do it, but their biggest problem is Islam. As soon as they raise Western values in Morocco, Egypt, Pakistan, they are confronted. That is un-Islamic. So if we don't address Islam, how are we ever going to get past it? Okay. I tend to slightly disagree with you. I think the, um, there's no question that completely detaching uh, the religious component to all the problems that we see, whether it's with you know, the Al-Qaeda, the violent ones, or with the Brotherhood, is a mistake. And I think that uh, from a Western perspective, we have done that excessively, just making the argument that it has nothing to do with Islam. But I would also slightly disagree with you that the problem is it's Islam itself. Because the, uh, there's a lot of scholars that make the argument that the West is, in, is just collateral damage in an internal civil war that is taking place within Islam uh, in terms of what is the interpretation of Islam. Not everybody agrees with, uh, with the Brotherhood, with Al-Qaeda, with Salafis, with Islamist groups. And, you know, you, you talked about different countries. I mean, quite a few countries have had civil wars over that. I mean, I deal a lot with Algeria. Uh, there was a civil war with more than 100,000 people killed because not everybody wanted, to be, wanted Algeria to be an Islamic state. And some of them were, you know, the people who don't, didn't want an Islamic state were quite conservative Muslims uh, who nevertheless do not interpret Islam in an aggressive way, uh, can be very pious, uh, but do not seek to, first of all, see Islam as all-encompassing private and, polit and, uh, and public life, and be imposing their views on, uh, on others. So the, the, the tension starts within the Islamic world where a lot of people do not ascribe to those interpretations of Islam, which to some degree even somebody like Erdogan does ascribe to, because Erdogan comes from this sort of Muslim Brotherhood Islamist, uh, Islamist milieu. But if you, you just remain in Turkey, the other half of the country is staunchly secularist. And for Muslims, some of them might be conservative Muslims and praying five times a day and having other aspects of our private life regulated by Islam, but staunchly, staunchly secularist when it comes to public life. Uh, so there are unquestionably some theological issues that need to be addressed within the Muslim world, but it's not necessarily the religion itself, it's what people make of the religion. And I think that goes for every religion. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk, Lorenzo. I just had a quick question about your subtitle, uh, Social Service or Takia. And I was wondering about this word Takia. Uh, I guess it's a two-part question. One, do the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, has anyone actually used this term, Takia? And if so, uh, these are Sunni groups, and Takia is a Shi uh, concept, not a Sunni concept. As far as I know, there's no precedent for Sunnis using the concept of Takia. So, uh, if they are using it, where are they getting it from? Right. Well, the disclaimer here should be that I didn't give the subtitle, so I can get, get out of that very easy. Um, now, it, it, yes, it is a true disclaimer because I didn't give the subtitle. Uh, but I, I was okay with it. I would have said something if uh, had I been okay with it. You're perfectly right. It's a term that comes from Shia um, uh, theology. 
uh, and it's not necessarily used by Sunni. I think what, uh, what it has become most in the Western uh, um, setting to mean is this sort of doublespeak deception in which the Brotherhood does, according to critics, and I think it's fair to say, uh, engage. So it is a Shia concept. The brother, brothers themselves would never use it, but I mean, it just makes sense. But we say, yes, my tactic is deception, uh, just of course, something they would never use uh, publicly. Uh, and so it's probably technically incorrect. Uh, you're right, but I think it has become kind of common jargon parlance in, uh, in the US to see this sort of double speak in which I would say fairly, uh, it's fair to say that these groups do engage. Um, yes, thank you uh, for the scope that you provided. I think I understood early in your talk that you referred to a prominent early role of the Muslim Brotherhood in facilitating getting Wahhabist imams as chaplains into, into prisons, yes. U.S. prisons. What I'd like to ask you is, uh, what role do the Muslim Brotherhoods play in facilitating uh, the integration of these convicts once they've completed their term in prison and now are faithful Muslims. What role does the Muslim Brotherhood play in reintegrating with them once they are leaving prison? It's, it's very difficult to say. I don't see a very big of an organized effort um, to then really individually follow uh, people who convert in jail. Uh, I don't have any evidence of that. I don't think that is what is taking place. Uh, you know, one thing that I said is, you know, intent and capabilities. I don't want to make the Brotherhood out to be, you know, this, you know, 15 foot tall monsters where they all, all mighty and all powerful. Uh, so they don't even, assuming that they would want to do something like that, I don't think they would have the resources. The numbers are what they are. Uh, the effort has been, and we've seen evidence, you know, the, the Alamudi case, but many others, in getting very moms in the prison system. Uh, a, more, a more systematic effort to then kind of, you know, track, list and track down and follow all the people that then, you know, through jail convert to Islam. I don't have any evidence of that. I would probably be skeptical that something like that is taking place. Just to follow up on that, uh, are these uh, imams ones who have ties to the Wahhabist roots in Saudi Arabia? Uh, some of them do. I mean, the, the institute that for a long time uh, has provided imams is funded by the Saudi embassy. Uh, so absolutely, yes. Uh, the, the, the relationship has always been, yes. Uh, they're Wahhab to, they're Wahhabis. Yes, Saudi Arabia, so hence, uh, therefore, yes, with sort of a Wahhabist uh, uh, ideology. I mean, most of the imams, uh, uh, that brotherhood organizations have been uh, pushing come from uh, mostly Saudi training, therefore uh, Wahhabi in their interpretation of Islam. Yes, that, that is fair to say. Uh, from a strictly you know, theological point of view, the brotherhood interpretation of Islam is very such a thing. There are you know, also uh, internal arguments exactly, you know, on a theological level inside the brotherhood and the Saudi uh, official uh, interpretation of Islam. There are some differences there, but those differences have always be been secondary to the larger goal, which is of working together, and the brothers sort of providing the brain power, and the Saudis providing the funds to spreading a certain conservative interpretation of Islam worldwide. Uh, that has been going back to the, the 1960s, when I, you know, I talked about immigration, how brotherhood people, uh, brotherhood um, militants left Egypt and other countries and found jobs. Those who came to the West were just a minority, but the majority went to the Arab Gulf and, and obtained a pretty prominent position in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, created organizations like the Muslim World League, the World Assembly of Muslim Youth, which are multi-million dollar transnational organizations, technically NGO, but in reality very much linked to the Saudi government that have uh, built, you know, the largest mosques in, uh, throughout the world, whether in a Muslim majority country or in non-Muslim majority countries, uh, printed uh, and, and trans translated and printed millions of copies of uh, um, Muslim Brotherhood and Wahhabi uh, ideology. Uh, so it's a marriage of uh, convenience that has been going on for a long time. It had its, like all marriages, its ups and downs. Uh, in a couple of circumstances, but it, uh, that is what has helped Brotherhood organizations have these resources. Thank you. Hi. 
Uh, other than our own feelings about what's the quote unquote right religion, the social and political activities being done by these Muslim organizations, are they really that much different than those being done by Jewish organizations or social we conservative Christian organizations? No, they're very similar. They're absolutely very similar. Uh, the, the, the lobbying part of it, paradoxically, um, a lot of these brotherhood organizations are modeled on Jewish organizations by their own admission. Uh, a part has to do with their conspiratorial mindset in which they see Jewish organizations controlling everything. So the argument was, well, Let's do it ourselves and compete with them and do the same thing as ourselves, of course. It's a kind of conspiratorial mindset. Uh, but the lobbying organizations, very much modeled on the, the model of the division of roles between different Jewish organizations, very, very similar and studied uh, on purpose to be very similar. At the social level, at the grassroots level, very similar to all kind of religious organizations you would find. What I would argue that is different, and I mean, and I, I, you know, there's other people who would then ask me a similar question and say, well, what is the difference between some of these organizations that want, you know, maintain the strong Islamic identity uh, to, you know, Orthodox Jews or Amish in Pennsylvania, Amish? Uh, the difference is the, the, the political agenda that they have. It's not just, you know, this conservatism from a social point of view. Uh, but is the uh, domestic and foreign agenda, which is, I think is domestically arguably incompatible with integration, and when it comes to the foreign agenda, arguably uh, incompatible with, with core Western interests. Uh, is it legitimate? Yes. Is it dangerous? I would argue yes. Thank you. We'll take uh, one last question from Dr. Thanks. Thank you again. Um, there are lots of debates, um, I'm not sure that they lead to clarity, um, about the question of Sharia law. Uh, what I'm interested in, is there a evidence in terms of what they say or what they do, those members of the Muslim Brotherhood, say in regard to Sharia law when it contrasts with civil law or constitutional law? Yeah. Where's the primacy? Uh, I think that's where Takia comes back into play. Uh, because they take, of course, very different positions. First of all, they have not made, in the West, we're talking about specifically about the West, they have, at this point, not made Sharia the core uh, priority. Because I think being very smart, very pragmatic, they understand that they're not gonna be turning you know, the United States, Germany, France, into a Sharia-run country anytime soon. And they understand that it's a very sensitive issue that would attract a lot of controversy. So, of course, the idea of eventually one day introducing Sharia looms in their imagination, no question about it, but it's not one of their priorities. They are nevertheless doing certain things Sharia-related. Uh, both in the United States uh, and in Europe, they have created what, what are you know, jurisprudential advisory bodies. So in Europe, it's called the European Council for Fatwa and Research, which is headed by Yusuf al-Qaradawi, which is sort of the global leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, and they have a similar body in the United States. Um, where they provide advice uh, to Muslims ostensibly to um, find ways to practice Sharia, of course not all aspects, not the criminal aspects of Sharia, not, uh, but for example uh, the parts of Sharia that regulate uh, uh, inheritance, uh, marriage, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, making compatible with Western law. The reality is, is that in many cases it is not compatible and the primacy goes to uh, Sharia. So if few and few people do that, I mean, of course, when we're gonna issue the press release about their annual meeting, they're gonna say, well, of course we want, you know, uh, make it compatible and uh, the primacy goes to Western law. Then they publish that 1,000 page report of their fatwas, which nobody reads. I'm one of the few people with a lot of time on their hands who actually does read them and there's a lot of things where the incompatibility is there. So in some fatwas you will, some, most of the fatwas are extremely benign and are, for example, if a Canadian Muslim asks uh, uh, when can he pray, you know, because, you know, the, the lighting being how it is, you know, or the fasting, there's always light, you don't want to, you know, fast for 19 hours straight. You know. uh, but there are some issues where the incompatibility is right there. Uh, when the husband is allowed to forbid his wife to cut her hair where the husband is allowed to beat her up gently uh, if she disobeys him. 
where uh, uh, the woman gets half of the inheritance. Uh, and both principles are there. Their arguments, their defense, um, when I you know, interviewed some of these individuals and asked them, well, where's the compatibility there? I said, well, bottom line, that's in the Quran, and we cannot compromise that part. If you take Islam, uh, you do not, you take everything of it. You cannot pick and choose. Uh, so if in the Quran says that the woman uh, inherits half of what uh, the man does, we can't really change that just because we live in Sweden or in America. Other people would disagree and, and assert the primacy. I've noticed in, in, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the speakers you had giving the lecture a few years ago was Zudi Jasser. And Zudi, uh, who I know well, lives by a lot of Sharia principles personally, but only as long as they are compatible. So his personal relation, his uh, marriage with his wife is regulated by Sharia principle, but only as long as they are compatible. So somebody would say, yes, he, pick, uh, he picks and chooses. Yes, he does. Uh, because he acknowledges the primacy of Western law because of uh, its primacy to human rights and equality of sexes. So just as a quick follow-up, um, I think we were blessed by having Judy speak here. And if anybody who knows him, I can't imagine him hitting his wife. <laughs> Aside from okay? that, yes. But the main issue is, for the faithful, I think the drift logically of what you're saying is you can't carve up and piecemeal Sharia law. It's either of the Koran or it's not. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a very valid point that we go back to, to your question. Uh, I think you have plenty of individuals that take a different interpretation and says, well, we actually do pick and choose because they take a, a less literal, literalist interpretation and more of an historical interpretation. Uh, and the, the, the answer that somebody like Zudi or somebody would give you is that what the Quran prescribed 14 centuries ago was actually an advancement to the situation of women that they had in pre-Islamic Arabia, where the women were treated less than, than camels and cows. Uh, so even giving them half of the inheritance was a major step forward. Uh, we live in 21st century America. We take it two or 15 steps forward, uh, and there's complete equality between, uh, between men and women. So we, you give an historical interpretation to those verses and not a literalist interpretation to those verses. You understand that it's in a way, you know, the debate about the interpretation of the Constitution. It's the Scalia approach versus the, uh, the other judge, justices on the Supreme Court. It's the historical approach or the, the literalist approach, the evolutionarist approach or the other approach. And many individuals say, well, when verses are clearly at odds with values, uh, that are clear violations of human rights, those are verses that we're not going to apply. The Barbary pirates, who weren't so long ago, seem to apply very specific concepts about treating women or people of a non-faith prisoners. But thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to thank uh, Lorenzo for a very careful and erudite treatment of a very uh, sensitive subject. I think the takeaway for me, if you go to his analysis of that 1993 meeting in Philadelphia of Islamists, uh, which led eventually to the emergence of the organization known as CARE, uh, I would say his policy prescription would best be summarized by or uh, summarized by a statement similar to one that Ronald Reagan made in a much different context. Ronald Reagan said, uh, trust but verify. I would say uh, Lorenzo is actually saying, don't trust and verify. Anyway, thank you all uh, for coming. Thank you, Dr. Templeton, for supporting the lecture series. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>